Good day, everyone. Um, welcome to our very special live presentation. And uh, please allow us just uh, 30 more seconds to connect all of our live streams and allow for live stream participants to join. We appreciate your patience. Thank you. Great, looks like we're on. Welcome everyone and uh, have a, let's have a very happy Ranch Choice Voting Day um, webinar presentation. Uh, our pre presentation is called The Fight for Voter Democracy, Ranked Choice Voting and Proportional Representation. For those of you who are not aware that there was such a thing as RCV Day, uh, no worries, you're not alone. Um, I for completely forgot when it, when it was and then um, was reminded by our folks at Fair Vote and other Greens. Um, and uh, that's what <clears throat> we have several presenters who will um, speak to you uh, today about RCV, Ranked Choice Voting. Um, as soon as we end this meeting, um, we are going to be talking about uh, and hopefully uh, getting the word out and, and doing things to, to spread the word, to build a movement about uh, RCV, to uh, get the word out and build a movement for voter democracy in this country. Uh, voter choice, if voter choice was equal or more important than voter access, um, that would be a great thing uh, because it is. And we're currently fighting pretty hard for the right to get on the ballot, which is super important. However, even if the voter makes it to the polling station, they are far too often left without an option or two very disappointing choices, to say the least. So um, to introduce myself, my name is Tony Ndege. I am uh, a co-chair of the National Ballot Access Committee, and I'm also a co-chair of North Carolina Green Party. We have a very impressive list of presenters who will be speaking today in alpha order. We have Robin Harris, a co-chair of Green Party of Florida, and she's a 2022 candidate for state representative. Uh, we also have Howie Hawkins, Green Party co-founder, the original Green New Dealer, can, and also uh, a several time candidate and former 2020 Green Party nominee for president. We also have Matthew Ho, a journalist, anti-war veteran, and 2022 North Carolina candidate for US Senate. We have Lynn Serpy, former Green, Green Party candidate in New York and a highly sought after, uh, sought after consultant. I would also like to thank um, our moderators here, Rose, Lizzie, Jenny, and Tommy um, for helping out with our viewers uh, here on the live stream. Um, we also have a, a special guest from Fair Vote, uh, which is a nonpartisan uh, organization, but I, I'm very happy that they're here today. And we have, uh, um, we have a, a Diane, uh, Diane Silver, who is a, a special guest from that organization. So before we begin our presentation, I would be remiss not to thank our very non-corporate sponsors, the Green Party of the United States, the only nationwide party that does not take corporate cash and also stands for people, peace, and planet before profit. And I also want to thank the other members and, and uh, sponsors of the Ballot Access Committee, which provides much needed ballot access assistance to state parties and candidates across the country. Please visit our site at www.gp.org and please do donate for the extremely important ballot access uh, projects that we have here at www.gp.org 
forward slash BAC, as in Ballot Access Committee. After our presentations, we will have about half an hour for Q&A. Uh, for those of you who joined us on Zoom, please um, submit your questions to Rose in the chat function. For those of you who are joining us over live stream, uh, we'll be monitoring your chat for questions as well. Okay, so without any further uh, delay, we're, we are going to introduce our first guest, who is uh, Diane Silver. She's with a representative of Fair Vote, and she's joining us from uh, overseas, but uh, we're so happy to have you here today. Diane, happy Ranked Choice Voting Day. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, I appreciate uh, the chance to be here with you. I am going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can share some slides with everybody. Can you confirm that those are showing up as desired? I'm not hearing. Yeah, I'm seeing some nodding. Great. All right. I'm going to presume you're seeing that. Um, so I appreciate the chance to be with you uh, to talk about ranked choice voting and proportional representation. And I'm going to try to share a lot of information in just a few minutes. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, what is ranked choice voting? The basic idea is that instead of voting for just one candidate, voters have the option to rank the candidates in order of preference, as you can see in the sample ballot on the slide. First choice, second choice, third choice. And the big idea is that instead of being able to win with simply the most votes, a candidate has to win a majority of votes to take office. It's a simple change with really powerful impact. Majority rule is a basic tenet of democracy, but we don't actually have it here in the United States of America, which is hard to believe. So here's how it works. Um, initially, only first choices are counted. So the way we vote now, which is called plurality voting, if these were the results, this blue candidate would win. They have the most votes, but you can see that because there are more than two candidates, they don't have a majority of votes. Majority means more than 50%. So to have a majority, we need to have a runoff. And thanks to ranking, it's going to be an instant runoff. What happens is the lowest vote getter is eliminated. And then all the votes are counted again. So if blue, lavender, or orange was your favorite, then your vote continues to count for them. They're still your favorite. And only the purple voters need to essentially choose someone new as if it were a, an in-person runoff. So we know who they wanna vote for. It's their second choice in their ranking. So the purple votes get distributed to those voters second choice. And then we count all the votes again. This is the second round. It's like a, the, a runoff round. It's, it is a runoff round. So now we still have no majority winner, so we do it again. This time, the orange candidate is the low vote getter, so they're gonna be eliminated, and we're going to distribute those votes to the next highest ranked candidate on each of those ballots, and then we count again, and now we have a majority winner. And the beauty of this process is that votes coalesce around the candidate who is really the most preferred. So um, our data shows that with ranked choice voting, the number of ballots with winning candidates in the top three is actually much higher than just the 50% threshold needed to win. So it gives us a broad consensus with a lot of voters, a great majority of voters feeling pretty satisfied with the outcome. And this can do a lot to break the hyper-partisanship that is crippling our government. Benefits of ranked choice voting. There are lots of benefits. I'm gonna home in on the most important ones. Um, one of the biggest problems with the way we vote now is vote splitting and how that leads to strategic voting. So you may have heard this one before. Why are you throwing away your vote? Um, why are you voting for a spoiler, right? So with the way we vote now, voters end up having to play mind games. You're thinking, I really like candidate B, but I know they're a long shot. So maybe I should vote better just vote for A, because if I vote for B, then I'm taking a vote away from A. And if that happens, then C might win. And I really don't like C. And, you know, it becomes this strategic game. Voters should not have to play games when they vote. We should be able to just vote honestly. And ranked choice voting solves these problems. It allows you to rank your favorite as number one. And if they're a long shot and they get eliminated, your vote simply counts for your next favorite. 
um, in that instant runoff. It's, it's a way to have your cake and eat it too. You can vote for your real favorite and you can also support your next choice without inadvertently helping your nemesis. Um, Ranked choice voting is the fastest growing voting reform in the country. It's now used in about 55 jurisdictions. Uh, we've had about 500 elections to date. And from all that experience, we have really good data to document how well it works. Uh, voters, number one, voters really like ranked choice voting. Um, last fall in Utah, about 23 different jurisdictions used it. 86% of voters reported that they were satisfied with ranked choice voting. Um, when given the option to rank, voters do in high numbers. Uh, we have data from New York City from that mayoral election back last summer, 89% of voters used the opportunity to rank. So that really demonstrates that it's a method that voters like, they understand, and they use it. One thing we really like about ranked choice voting is that it improves representation for women and people of color. Um, we have numbers that prove this, and we, we can see that one of the biggest culprits in blocking that kind of representation is that vote splitting that I just talked about. When there are more than two candidates from some underrepresented communities, we know community leaders will tell folks, wait your turn, because they know that if there are more than two candidates in the race, they are likely to split the vote. But with ranked choice voting, we found that when there are two or more candidates from some subgroup, it actually generates interest and it generates voter turnout. And it's more likely that one of those candidates will win. Votes will coalesce in that community and one of those candidates will be lifted up and be able to win. We've also found that ranked choice voting leads to more positive campaigning. So all of these are great benefits. Moving right along, this brings us to proportional representation, which is really the gold standard for democratic representation. We believe in majority rule with minority voice. We believe that if a group makes up a significant portion of the electorate, they deserve to have a seat at the table. So the big idea with proportional representation is that instead of being represented by one legislator per district, we would have larger regional districts and we would have multiple members elected from each district, the way that you see in the graph. That because the way that that would work is that then the total body, whether it's the state house or a city council or house of representatives, the total body comes close to proportional to the makeup of the electorate. And so as a little example, in Massachusetts, Nearly 40% of the state is Republican, but there are zero Republican Congress members. At the same time, 60% um, is perceived to be Democrats, but a large number of those might actually identify as Democratic Socialists or as Greens, right? Um, but we don't know, and they don't have a Congress member either. With proportional ranked choice voting, we would have these larger districts with multiple representatives representing the left, center, and right from each community. Now, of course, in another state like Arkansas or Oklahoma, it would be similar, but sort of reverse. They um, have some portion of the electorate that runs progressive, but they have zero representatives. And so the same thing would happen to benefit those folks. Right choice voting doesn't benefit any one party. It simply represents the people more accurately. There's more nuanced representation. Um, so benefits of proportional ranked choice voting, it's all the benefits of single winner ranked choice voting, plus it really reduces the impact of gerrymandering, makes gerrymandering virtually impossible. Every American has multiple representatives instead of one, so there's a good chance there's going to be somebody who represents you who's more aligned with your views. It eliminates um, those safe districts and gives us more competitive districts so that elections really mean something. It makes space for legislators from outside the two party system and it provides incentives for legislators to collaborate when they share a constituency. And all of these things would help make our government run better and would be better, better represent and would better represent the people, government of, for, and by the people. There's a bill in Congress called the Fair Representation Act, which we at Fair Vote support. It would, um, it would elect Congress, the House of Representatives, through this proportional ranked choice voting. And that is our ultimate goal at Fair Vote. So that is probably a little bit more than my time. And I'm going to stop there and turn it back. And I look forward to more discussion in the question and answer.
Perfect. Thank you, Diane. And we have lots of questions already. Our next presenter Our is Lynn Serpy. Lynn Serpy has over two decades of experience with ranked choice voting and proportional voting systems throughout the United States and around the world. Uh, she served as the National Single Transferable Voting STV Coordinator for the New Zealand Parliament. Uh, Lynn also has over 10 years of experience working as a freelance election administrator. We're so lucky to have you today, Lynn. Happy RCV Day. Happy RCV Day. Thank you so much uh, for putting together this panel and everyone who's been involved with that process. And uh, thank you for that introduction, fair vote, so I can talk about different, different issues, uh, which I will. So I'm going to focus on proportional representation. And I'm going to start that for me, the two party system in our country is one of the single biggest problems. It is a deep systemic problem. And so we need to change the voting system. Um, I'm not an easy ask. I first started working on these issues in 1995. So it's been over 25 years. And while we have had successes, as Fair Vote mentioned, um, they've been few and far between, especially when we're referring to proportional representation. So for me, it's very important to do two things is to work on building a third party, like the Green Party, but then work on reforming the voting system so that when you vote for that party, that your votes count, that they matter, and that they ideally help get people elected. Because I firmly believe that diverse viewpoints around the legislative table make better public policy. And that's not just a theoretical belief. As mentioned, I worked for the New Zealand Parliament. I worked for the Greens in Parliament. I worked for members of Parliament who were elected under what's referred to as an MMP, Mixed Member Proportional System. But I also worked on 18 different referenda campaigns for the single transferable vote all over the country. I worked on SEV campaigns in British Columbia as well. I was an election observer um, for the election in Scotland for STV. So I have a lot of experience campaigning for different voting systems, campaigning under different voting systems, making sure that the votes themselves were counted properly, both as an election administrator and an international election observer. And of course I was and have been a Green Party candidate. So I try to attack this issue, and that's probably not the right word, attack, let's say I address this issue from a number of fronts. So for me, I want to say that there is no perfect voting system, right? There are different problems we're trying to solve. And so different jurisdictions will have different goals that they're trying to reach, but there are definitely some systems which have proven to be uh, better, better for their outcomes, better for their voters. And so I wanna specifically today talk about STV, the single transferable vote, and MMP, mixed member proportional. So STV, the single transferable vote, actually falls under that umbrella of ranked choice voting. So for the voter, it's exactly the same as what Diane just outlined. You vote your candidates in order of preference, first choice, second choice, third choice. The difference is you're not just electing one person, you're electing multiple people. It might be a multi-winner district, a multi-member district, it might be at large, it might be nationwide. The implementation details will be something that reformers have to be looking at and trying to address when coming up with a solution to propose to their jurisdiction. So STV has the geographic representation of single member seats, but because it's proportional, you also can address other issues of representation. So single member seats to me in and of itself are a relic of the past. They are based on the idea that once upon a time we had to like ride a horse or a mule or a donkey or whatever, you know, five days across town in order to maybe talk to our representative that it might take you know, three weeks for a letter in the mail to reach your representative. That is no longer our world. So geographic representation, where it depends on whether you live at 100 Main Street or across at 101 Main Street, because you have a, a border, a boundary, a district that cuts in between, geographic representation is very limiting. I'm not saying it's not important, especially in local elections where you have these very hyper-local issues, but I'm saying that for me and for many voters, where we live, which is often a product of economics, let's be honest, where we live is not necessarily what most defines us. So there might be other ways that we wanna seek representation. And so proportional representation is really what allows that. At its heart, 5% of the vote, 5% of the seats, 10% of the vote, 10% of the seats. It's an oversimplification, but that is a good way to think about it. So if you are someone who has a lived experience different than many of our traditional elected leaders, there's probably other people in your community 
who are like you. They might um, be looking to have a representative because of their gender or their age or their sexual orientation or their mobility issues or their ideology or because they care about a single issue. There's so many different types of representation that's possible and only proportional representation really allows for those people to then get elected. So the single transferable vote, you have these multi-winner districts. Maybe it's a three-member district, maybe it's a 10-member district, whatever it might be. Um, so you're electing the candidates, first choice, second choice, third choice. Under MMP, which is a mixed member proportional system, you actually get two votes. And MMP is used in Germany, it's used in New Zealand. Those are probably two of the countries that people are most familiar with. And they're also two of the countries that many people consider some of the strongest Green parties around. So when you go and elect, you have your two votes, your single member constituency winner. So they still keep that geographic representation because as I said, there can be some value to it, just not the only value in terms of representation. But then they have a second vote, which is called a party vote. And that's literally what you do is you vote for which party you wanna see representing you in parliament. And so in a party vote system, you have what's referred to as a threshold or quota. You actually have that under STV as well. And that is generally a minimum number of votes that you need to receive in order to get elected. In New Zealand, that threshold is 5% of the vote. As I mentioned earlier, 5% of the vote, 5% of the seats. So you go and you vote for your single member constituency member and you go and you vote for your party list, the party that you wanna see represented. And this has resulted really in multi-party democracy because there are now diverse viewpoints at the legislative table making public policy. And from my experience, they make better public policy because they have to cooperate with each other because they have the opportunity to be in select committees and hearings. And you know, the work of government happens behind the scenes a lot of times. Sometimes it's backroom deals, but sometimes it's literally slogging through hours and hours and hours of research and testimony and putting a comma in the right place so that you're improving housing for hundreds of thousands of people or whatever the issue might be. So I'm a big fan of STV and MMP because I think they combine that, that single member geographic type ideology with multi-member seats and party list um, voting so that you have other types of representation as well. I should also mention that when you have a smaller threshold to get elected, it almost acts as like de facto campaign finance reform. So if you only need to get 5% of the vote or 10% of the vote or 20% of the vote, you don't have to go out and try to campaign for 50 plus 1% of the vote. That means you don't have to spend as much money. You don't have to accept corporate contributions. You don't have to um, try to get so many people to vote for you so you can spend less money, which opens up the process to a wider range of people who otherwise may not be able to compete in a winner take all or you know, plurality environment, which as we have seen costs so much money. So for me, proportional representation addresses this issue of the two party system you know, in a very clear way. So I, of course, would love to see the Green Party take this issue really seriously and um, decide to work on it because it's great to build a party that people want to vote for. But trust me, as ha having worked for the New Zealand Parliament, it's even better to see those people get elected and make amazing public policy that benefits people and planet. And so I really want to encourage people to look at proportional representation. When I first started with this 25, 27 years ago, is there a time thing? Yes, I um, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're supposed to keep this to five minutes. To keep it's really only because we have this wonderful distinguished panel and we have people who are asking questions. So I've been letting people go a little over, but uh, we just want to make sure everybody gets in and people get their questions answers. I'm going to ask okay. our right. distinguished sure. panelists was, going forward to try it, to keep it in that fine. five minute range. Right. Howie right. can tell you I Howie can tell you. Bit of a pain in the butt about this stuff, but I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. Oh, Thank you. That's okay. Where's I was told. Yeah, yeah, seven minutes. Longer than five minutes, but we just took a long time to say that I went well, over time. My, my apologies. Seven minutes. My, my Actually, people have seven minutes, and you were just about yeah. seven so, minutes. Call to action, and that is really what I wanted to end with. It's a call to action, which is let's please take this very seriously, and let's please act on this. I've been a Green since 1994. I became aware of these issues since 1995. And we have not done enough, in my opinion, to really advance proportional representation as a priority. Thank you, and thank you, Rose. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Our panelists are going to be able to, if you didn't get to, if you don't get to finish what you were um, wanted to say, please uh, feel free to add to anything you wanted to say in the Q&A. We do have a, a plenty of time uh, in the Q&A. So sorry for that confusion there. Uh, I'm going to read the, uh, the Green Party platform really quickly on proportional representation because our next speaker, um, I'd love to hear more from him on that. Um, the Green Party supports the replacement of the winner take all seat district with proportional re representation across multi seat districts, which more accurately represents the political will of their actual constituents. These systems are well understood and used in many other countries. Proportional representation can be used across a seat, a district, or a state for local, state, or federal elections. So, um, our next speaker is an absolute boss on this topic. Um, Needs no introduction, but I will introduce him anyhow. Howie Hawkins, he was the 2020 presidential uh, nominee for the Green Party. His bids for governor won ballot access for New York multiple times. Howie is a retired UPS worker, a writer, founding Green member, and a lifelong activist. Thank you so much for joining us, Howie. Take it away. Well, thank you, Tony, and thanks for organizing this forum. I think it's of vital importance to the Green Party. I think ranked choice voting and proportional representation are key issues for the Green Party. And like what Lynn was saying, we've had it on our plank, along with a long list of planks. It should move to the top. The biggest takeaway from my presidential campaign is that we were marginalized by this system. We were excluded. We got, you know, blanked out by the commercial corporate media as well as the independent progressive media. And that's due to the single member district winner take all system. And it's worse than ever before because the Republican party is no longer just a conservative party. It's an extremist party, racist, irrationalist and fundamentally anti-democratic. I mean, just this week, we've had new revelations. Trump had an executive order drafted to seize the voting machines, have the military seize the voting machines. We have somebody indicted for threatening or trying to hire somebody to kill election officials. Election officials are quitting because they're being intimidated. Voter suppression laws are passing, voter roll purges, uh, intimidation of honest election administrators, violent and just harassing people, onerous voter ID and absentee ballot requirements. So we're in a democracy crisis and it's being talked about at least in the liberal corporate media. And we're in a political dynamic where as the Republicans move to the right, most progressive minded people think I got to vote for them lesser evil Democrats, even though I prefer the Green Party because we got to stop these extremist Republicans. That's what the incentive structure in the spoiler effect that's inherent in the political system we're dealing with. And it's getting worse. It's gonna be harder for us going forward. But let's also recognize that the Democratic Party is not so damn Democratic either. Despite their lip service to voting rights, and you wonder where all this voting rights legislation has been, uh, they are about party suppression, particularly the Green Party. That's what authoritarian governments do. And the Green Party brings new voters to the polls. We know from the 2016 exit polls that 61% of Jill Stein, the presidential candidate for the Green Party, her voters would have stayed home if she wasn't on the ballot. So you suppress the Green Party, you suppress the vote. So I think that means Greens should make, maybe under the theme of inclusive democracy, fair ballot access, ranked choice voting for executive offices, and proportional representation for legislative bodies central to our issue and electoral campaigns. And we have to attack really openly the exclusionary nature of single member district winner take all elections. They've resulted in a Congress where 90% of the districts are non-competitive, state legislatures where 95% of the districts are non-competitive. And that not only excludes the Green Party, it excludes members of major parties who are the minority in their particular district. These are one party states. That's not democratic. So the Greens need to support uh, election measures for voting rights and election protection that just uh, failed again in the Senate. But it also means that what we got to lead on is the notion of inclusive democracy that includes 
candidate access to the ballot as well as voter access to the ballot. And I think that means we need three major reforms. One is fair ballot access laws. If you don't have more than two candidates on the ballot, ranked choice voting is irrelevant. And we have a situation where the Democrats have been making it harder for the Green Party to get on the ballot. New York, Nevada, and other states recently. Uh, my campaign was sued on frivolous grounds in, in several states where hack judges for the Democratic Party knocked us off the ballot without regard to the law and the facts of each case. Um, this is, you know, a th what authoritarian governments do. And so fair ballot access is directly relevant. So I think that's got to be one of our top issues. And then we should be talking about ranked choice voting for executive offices and proportional representation for legislative offices. And that we can raise at every level. Um, ranked choice voting for the executive offices, local, state, federal. With regard to the president, I'm gonna put this in the chat when I'm done. There's an article out by um, Rob Ritchie and some other people at Fair Vote and some lawyers about how under the constitution, article two, section one in the 12th amendment, Congress has the power to regulate presidential elections in the electoral college. So we don't need to amend the constitution to get to a ranked choice national popular vote for president. There is legislation in Congress for a popular vote for president, but not a ranked choice one. And without the ranked choice, we're gonna be marginalized in this political dynamic. So look for that article and they have model legislation in there that uh, green candidates can point to. Um, and it's online, it's not behind a paywall. Um, and then another point I would like to make with regard to the ranked choice voting proposals that are coming backed by a lot of big tech money and Andrew Yang and people like that, they're talking about a top five open primary followed by a ranked choice vote for the general election. And what that does is destroy parties. Parties become irrelevant to the nomination process Parties are important to real democracy. That's where voters can get organized and educated and pick people to represent their political viewpoint. If we leave it up to a jungle primary, uh, anybody who got fat cat money behind them can push themselves to the top. So we're gonna get a five fat cat back candidates from the major parties in all likelihood in this top five thing. So there are ballot initiatives. These people with the money are pushing in Nevada and Missouri. It's likely coming to a state near you, so watch out for that. Um, but I think the real game changer for us is ranked choice uh, proportional representation from multi-member districts. And that's, I think, been explained. I wanna point out to people, don't settle for ranked choice voting for single member districts for legislatures. Look at Australia. They have single member ranked choice voting for their house and multi-member ranked choice voting for their Senate. The Greens get over 10% of the vote, but in the last election, they only got one of 150 seats in the House because it's single member district ranked choice voting. With single member district, it don't matter much if it's plurality or ranked choice voting. On the other hand, in Australia, they have multi-member ranked choice voting for their Senate, and the Greens have nine senators, which is about 10% of the senators. It's you know, proportional to the vote they get. That's why we can't settle for single member district ranked choice voting for legislative bodies. That's just does nothing for us. It doesn't open up the political system to everybody. So I'm, about, I'm up with my time. So let me just conclude by urging those of you who are green candidates, those of you in green locals, push this issue to the top because given the current political climate, we're gonna be marginalized as spoilers in objectively helping the extremist Republican party. And we gotta have an answer for that. And that is our inclusive democracy includes candidates as well as voters, all political viewpoints. You can't suppress us. Let's open up the political system so everybody gets their fair and proportional share of representation. Wonderful, thank you, Howie, that's very inspiring. Um, our next speaker is Matthew Ho. Um, who hails from our, our state here. Uh, Matthew uh, is a 2022 North Carolina candidate for U.S. Senate. In 2009, Matthew resigned in protest from his post in Afghanistan with the State Department um, and very vocally took that 
to uh, basically the media and, and, and um, our society. So that's, that was a fantastic contribution. Um, in 2010, Matthew won the Ridenauer Prize for truth telling. Um, he's also a prolific writer and sought after speaker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tony. You Matthew? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Tony. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, thanks for everyone who put this together. Uh, it's an honor uh, to follow up after, Ho uh, after Howie. Um, Diane, it's good to see you again. Um, we have an effort here in North Carolina, Better Ballot North Carolina. Uh, I was involved with uh, the uh, formation of that last year. Um, actually, I guess two years ago, 2020 now. Um, and uh, I see uh, plenty of people uh, on this call who also were involved with that. So I, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I announced, uh, uh, or I should say, we announced our campaign uh, this past week for, for Senate um, and the excitement and enthusiasm we have re received uh, has really been uh, awesome. It's really been uh, overpowering almost at times. Uh, and of course, as you would suspect though, however, uh, former colleagues of mine who are part of the Democratic Party establishment uh, in Washington, D.C. have been incredibly upset. And they are upset because I may be a spoiler. And these are things that Diane addressed earlier and people understand. And, and we know how that is just a, a false argument, right? There, there's the, the, what I represent, what our platform represents. There is almost no overlap with the Democrats. I, I think you can make the argument that the Democrats have more overlap with the Republicans than they do with our platform, uh, particularly on life and death issues. Um, but one of the things I look at this and I say, why aren't these people who are so concerned about the spoiler candidates working on ranked choice voting? Why aren't they pushing for proportional representation? If they're so concerned about democracy, if they're so concerned about actually seeing the issues they pur purport to care about be put forward and enacted on, why aren't they doing something to break this, to break this, this log jam we have where nothing gets accomplished in Congress, which I think every, most people here would agree that goes back to the whole two party system. So why aren't they? And of course we know the answer because they're not really concerned about that. They're concerned with their own partisan identity. They're concerned with, with their group they belong to, so on and so on. But when I talk about these things with, with people who are outside of Washington, DC, not part of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, you know, you know, and you explain proportional representation to people or ranked choice voting, the answer you get is, you know, that sounds pretty good. That, that sounds like it makes sense. You know, when you say to somebody, does it make any sense that somebody gets 50.1% of the vote, the other person gets 49.9% of the vote, and that those people who voted for the 49.9 candidate effectively have no representation, considering how polarized things are in this country right now? Does that make any sense? And the people say, of course it doesn't. And then you say, you know, uh, you explain ranked choice voting, you talk about proportional representation, you even bring up maybe we should abolish this ele uh, electoral college system, you know, and people would say, yeah, how come we're not doing that? So I, I want to thank everyone who's here who's working on these issues, who is who's helping to educate, because more and more people, I think three or four years ago, if I walked out and said to somebody, what do you think of ranked choice voting? They would have looked at me like, what are you talking about? But now more and more people hear about it and they're excited. Because just the same reason that 62% of Americans want a third party, just as 20% of Americans have, a, have faith and trust and approval in our Congress, they, they also recognize that we need to change. We need to update. We need to strengthen. We need to make our democracy more inclusive. People realize this, and they appreciate that, and they want that. And, and I agree with Howie. This should be at the top of our issues. If you go to our campaign website, you go to the issues page, you will see that strengthening our democracy and electoral reform is at the top of our list. Because all the other things that we care about, all the other things that are so, so important to us that are a matter of life and death for us, climate change, health care, livable wages, ending the war on drugs, all those things that we work on as Greens, that this party, this campaign I'm a part of is, is, is going to be working for, I don't think any of that is ever going to be possible 
particularly the really scary stuff. You know, I heard someone the other day say, you know, as we hit 850,000 dead from COVID, right? Two years in, right? And, and 850,000 dead from COVID, we're fast approaching 1 million. Two years in, no improvements to the US healthcare system. I heard someone the other day say, you know what? They are just showing us how they're going to handle climate change. That if you want to know how they're going to handle climate change 20, 30, 40 years from now, when those existential consequences start really appearing, well, look how they're handling COVID. And in order to affect that, in order to do something about it, I think we have to change our electoral system. And I think first among that is everything we're talking about here today, ranked choice voting and proportional representation. So thank you, everyone, for putting this together. Thank you for joining us on your Sunday. And uh, yeah, I look forward to continuing to listen to everyone. And, and, and I, I know I'm learning a lot. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you, friend. Um, Matthew Ho, uh, who is the uh, current candidate, only green candidate so far for, for Senate, U.S. Senate. So thank you so much for that presentation, Matthew. Uh, Robin Harris is our uh, next speaker. She is a co-chair of the Green Party of Florida. She's also served as a co-chair of the Green Party of the National Black Caucus. She's also launching her campaign for state representative in Florida's District 46. Aside from her electoral and party roles, Robin is also a social justice activist, a writer, a poet, public speaker, tour guide, and history enthusiast. Thank you so much for joining us, Robin. Robin's going to be talking about how ranked choice voting will help her campaign or would help her campaign uh, in Florida and why it's so necessary. Thank you. Good evening or afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me and um, everything that's been said before has been very educational and helpful. And so, yes, um, to how ranked choice voting uh, would help me or would have helped me. Um, I actually um, ran uh, for county commissioner here in Orange County, Orlando, Florida, 2018. And real quick, um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. So um, there was an article, uh, interesting enough to, to, come out, to come out this uh, past week. Um, as this is coming up, I had no idea about Ranked Choice Voting Day, but an article came out here in Orlando, the Orlando Sentinel, about um, ghost candidates. So um, I'll tell you my experience with that. Uh, as, as I said before, I ran for county commissioner with the big time money machine. Um, you know, pro probably was no way I would have won, right? But um, we got down to, as, we, as the race proceeded, we got down to almost the very end of having to, you know, to qualify. And suddenly a name appears on the ballot um, with my same last name, um, that uh, Kenneth's last name was Harris. And so what it did was it, would, it ensured me not being able to go further in the race. Um, and so the article that came out in Orlando Sentinel talks about these ghost candidates. The mine was a very mild case, um, but there's so many um, <clears throat> issues like that. I believe with ranked choice voting, let the ghost candidates come on and see how you know they would probably not be ranked as high as those of us who have really worked um, grassroots efforts to, uh, to be on the ballot. So um, I found that to be very interesting. And so here we are now, um, 2022, uh, running for state office, uh, representative district 46. And this year in Florida is redistricting year. So there are a lot of elements here at play um, here in Florida. And it would benefit me if ranked choice voting was in place. Um, uh, the, the opposition won his last, won this last race by default. The race that I'm running in has not been voted, voted on since, if I'm correct, 2016. And so that gives Greens a little bit uh, of, a, of, a, of a boost and charge and hopefully momentum um, around this race. If we had ranked choice voting, I would be willing to, uh, to bet that as a Green that we could win because as, been, as, as we've heard off and on today, is that folks want to really have more than to choose between who's, who's the worst. They wanna be able to choose according, according to what their, where their values lie. And it shouldn't be, well, this person has a little bit of my value, but because they're Democrats, I'm gonna go ahead and choose, for, choose that person. We should, have, we should be willing to embrace 
I believe a paradigm shift in politics so that we can eradicate this political industrial complex. We, we see so many tactics that are thrown at us, um, how we named a lot of, of things that we face as well as Matthew. It's just that as third party candidates, I even talk about, you know, you know, God forsake, you know, voter suppression. I also feel like there's a thing as candidate suppression. Candidates such as myself that are grassroots, we were hit with everything. Um, I was, uh, I received a phone call about two weeks ago to ask me to, if I would, if I were to, if I would consider going to another race with three other people already in it so that this race could still stay open. Who does that? Well, Democrats do it. The establishment does it. And so I believe if we were to um, establish this ranked choice voting, again, it would eradicate these tactics and these ploys that are being used out in the open. It's, it's, I feel like it's open game day for most of us. So um, I wanna end by saying that, you know, we're, uh, we're haunted by this spoiler effect, you know, your spoiler candidates. I say, let's own that statement. We do want to be spoiler candidates. We want to spoil this system. We wanna shut it down. We wanna spoil it because it stinks, it's rotten and it's time for a change. Thank you. I'm Robin Harris, and I'm running for, uh, for State Representative District 46 in Orlando, Florida. Thank you. Right on. And whenever I say that North Carolina Green Party is, you can't spoil a rotten system. So thank you so much for, for uh, uh, saying that, uh, your words, Robin. Um, so we will, uh, without further delay, we are going to uh, switch to our Q&A section. Um, our Co-mods are going to ask some of the questions or, or statements that have really struck there um, um, that they've seen in our chats, as well as uh, we are also on, live on Twitter, as well as Facebook. So um, they are also going, going to ask some of those questions that they've been seeing. Um, they're going to be asking two questions at a time, and we'll have any panelists who do want to speak to speak about this, um, please uh, you know, sort of, or we're going to organically go through this, but if, if you want us to speak about it, um, please speak up first and we'll let you answer these questions. We can have a couple of panelists at, answer the questions at a time. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question here uh, on proportional representation. And that's, is this something we could do without a parliamentary system? Or do we need the latter for that system to be implemented? And while I didn't ask this question, I actually personally find it a very helpful answer to hear a uh, question to hear an answer to. And, um, and after that, uh, Chris Tony asked me to ask uh, to it at a time would be, uh, with RCV, it seems likely that the Green candidate would be eliminated in the first round because Green is likely to be the number one choice of the fewest voters. Would we Greens be better off to vote Green as second choice so the Green stays in the running longer? And those are the first two questions. Panel. I'd love to address the first one. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, proportional representation does not require a parliamentary system. Um, at its core, a proportional representation system requires multi-member seats. And we actually have those when we refer to like at large districts, those are multi-member seats. So this is something that is um, not difficult necessarily to implement in the United States. It doesn't require a parliamentary system. I think people think that way because that is where it has most often been implemented, but that is not a requirement. We just need multi-member seats uh, to kind of give you that short answer. Thank you. Uh, Hallie. Well, on the second question, don't outthink yourself on ranked choice voting. You vote for your favorite candidate second, they'll get eliminated faster. You know, it. you can't game ranked choice voting, so don't even try. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Lynn. 
Howie, I, I do have a question for you or any of our um, you know, candidates who'd like to answer it. Let's say we, we did an act proportional representation. So um, what, what would that look like for the average person? Because we're, we got to like really break this down for the average kind of a, a person we're going to be talking to on the street. What would it look, how would it look differently? You know, if we could even, you know, have some constitutional changes or what, whatever it takes, what, what would that um, electoral system look like when you walk into the uh, polling place? It would look like a single member ranked choice voting. There'd be a list of candidates and you'd rank your choices, one through whatever. If it's a, the Fair Representation Act that has been introduced into Congress would set up districts of three to five members where that's possible. I mean, a state like Vermont, there's only one member of Congress, so it's not possible there. And so you would be able to vote for as many as you want in order of preference. So you have a list of candidates and you just link rank them one, two, three. That's what it looks like to the voter going into the poll and looking at their ballot. I'd like to chime in and just and just reinforce what Howie has said, which is that ranked choice voting is super easy for voters. We have a lot of data at Fair Vote from crunching numbers that shows that there's no greater rate of ballot error or anything like that. And so opponents will try to tell you that this is too confusing, but it is in fact very straightforward. And the multi-winner system is exactly the same for the for voters from the voter perspective as the single winner system. You just rank order the candidates in order of preference and vote honestly. The best strategy is to just vote honestly. Yeah, you know, I would say, Tony, uh, is this this lets the voter vote their conscience, vote their principle. You know, they don't have to go into the voting booth pretending to be some kind of MSNBC pundit right? Making this calculation about lessers of two evils, they can just go to the ballot and vote their conscience without conscience. worrying without about the lesser of evil two part, you know, lesser of evil two party system without being feeling like they might be shamed for voting for, you know, someone who actually shares their values and beliefs. So I think this really expands democracy and really liberates it, uh, you know, in a way that you know, I don't think I've seen in my entire life. Lynn, you have your hand raised. I do. I want to just kind of go back to basics just for a second. So ranked choice voting, the acronym RCV, can be used in single member seats, like executive offices is how we talked about, and it can be used for multi-member seats. So as everyone keeps saying, whether you're voting for a single member seat or a multi-member seat, for you, the voter, it's exactly the same. You rank your candidates in order of preference. For other types of proportional systems, what I referred to were ones that fall under the umbrella of a party list system. And in that case, it's also a very simple vote. You just vote for the party that you want to see represented. There can be various tweaks within that system. There are literally dozens of voting systems in the world. So my thing is that I do want us to recognize that what might be a good solution in one city or state may not be the best solution in another city or state. But in general, you're, you have a lot of options. And so it does make sense to figure out what problem are you trying to solve? And that's really, I think I want to reinforce that to people, is not just a one-size-fits-all answer, RCV or else, but what problem are you trying to solve? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more answers on that question, and, and thank you all panelists for some great answers. Uh, next question is, uh, somebody notes that a lobbying group in their area showed statistics trying to prove that people of color and minorities don't understand RCV and only rank first choice. Please address. And the next one after that, I think kind of goes with the question, which is how does gerrymandering affect ranked choice voting? Panelists. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the first, the first uh, one on these and invite others to chime in. Fair Vote has done a lot of number crunching on this, um, and I'm happy to report that there is no difference in such demographics in terms of 
the understanding of how ranked choice voting works or the ability to fill out the ballot. There's absolutely no evidence of a higher rate of ballot error among some demographic groups or um, a higher rate of, uh, you know, a significantly different rate of, um, of ballot utilization. What we found um, from the New York City data, New York City's uh, primary elections last summer are the biggest test to date, the largest population that has that has used ranked choice voting. And what we found was that the um, the things that drove use of rankings was not um, some demographic uh, statistic, but rather two things. One was whether your first choice was perceived to be a front runner and how much of a front runner. So if you were voting for someone who as who seemed to be pretty pretty much ahead in terms of the media, you know, and the polling and such, there seemed to be less of a of a feeling of a need to rank additional candidates. Um, and so that was highly correlated. The other was whether the candidates themselves were putting out messaging, encouraging their supporters to not rank anybody else. There are some candidates who are not supporters of ranked choice voting and they ran campaigns saying, vote for me and only me. And so the, the rates of utilizing rankings were much more highly correlated with that than they were with any kind of racial demographic. And so if you're looking at you know, what makes people um, use the rankings or not, it's not about understanding, it's about those kinds of, of influences. Um, and we also have a lot of data, which I mentioned earlier, that shows that um, women and people of color uh, run more often and win more often under ranked choice voting than under plurality voting for the variety of, um, of reasons that, like, that I talked about, barriers to entry, removing those barriers to entry, having somebody on the ballot, having more choices on the ballot engages voters more. There are a lot of people who don't show up at all because they say, I hate them all. No, nobody on this ballot represents me. I'm not even gonna vote. And if we had a system that encouraged more people to step up and run because they wouldn't be shamed for being a spoiler, then there would be more chance of having somebody on the ballot who resonates with you as a voter. We believe that would drive voter turnout and that in turn will help um, provide that greater diversity of representation in elected, in elected office. So we have lots of data that shows that that, um, that, that concern is, is not borne out. Yeah, if if I could. Yes, uh, sure. yeah, okay. Yes, just to kind of piggyback uh, on what Diane said, I was part of a of a group um, in South Florida to to practice um, ranked choice voting for presidential candidates, and I was amongst the group. And they, well, the choices were Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and some other folks. And because I didn't select any of them. Um, I too was, it was thought that I didn't understand or maybe I needed more uh, guidance on how to vote. And I said, hell no, I'm not voting for any of these people. So that's why I'm not choosing any of them. Now, if you can allow me to choose none of the above, I'll do that. And so it's oftentimes not too much that we don't understand. Uh, I'm, and I'm speaking not as a person of color, I'm speaking as an African-American woman, is that um, we, our choices uh, don't identify with our values and we've been tricked and, and courted fakely so long, there's nobody to vote for. So again, ranked choice voting on these other systems, I'm hoping will be uh, more democratic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Lynn, yes. is your hand up or it just wasn't down from earlier? It is? Lynn. Great, thank you. So. Whenever we're talking about changing the voting system, there's probably at least four different opportunities to do voter education. There's the voter education you do during the, the campaign to change the voting system. It might be just to your council, but it also might go to the ballot as a referendum. Then there is when the system has been changed, hopefully, that the Board of Elections or whatever governing body in that jurisdiction, they do voter education. Then there's the voter education that candidates do, and then there's the voter education that parties do. So the issue of whether or not people understand or don't understand, what we have to think about if we're trying to reform a system is where there are opportunities for us to make sure that the voter education that gets out there gets out there that is diverse, 
So that's why when you're putting together your campaign committee for any reform change, you want your campaign committee to be diverse so that they can effectively communicate this issue to you know their constituents, the people who may be um, may not be reached by say the official policies of the board of elections or or in particular the parties, because that is certainly something we've seen again and again and again with implementation of single member RCV is that um, the parties have been encouraging people to basically bullet vote, you know, just rank one. And that really um, is a disservice. And you know, the Greens can consistently counter is doing better voter education, whether or not we have someone on the ballot. But, um, you know, Diane did a great job explaining that there's a lot of data on this, but I wanted to bring back to what that means for us as a party and how we can effectively try to combat this issue. Because certainly voter education is going to be important at all of the steps I mentioned. Howie? Yeah, I want to talk about the politics of this paternalistic racist canard that people of color can't handle ranked choice voting. A lot of it's coming from right wing think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, but it's also coming from incumbent black democratic politicians. Because if you go to ranked choice voting, uh, it's hard for these incumbents to discourage other black candidates from running in their district and quote unquote splitting the black vote because that won't happen with ranked choice voting. And we saw this with the more conservative wing of the uh, black and what do they call it? Black, Hispanic and Asian caucus in the New York City Council who were opposed to the ranked choice voting. We saw it when Benny Thompson of Mississippi voted against the For the People Act because it was against gerrymandering. And this is an issue, if you wanna go back and read Lainey Guineer who just passed her book, The Tyranny of the Majority. When she was head of the NACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, she was critical of majority minority districts as a remedy for the underrepresentation of black and other people of color because it created a quota, a ceiling on black representation. Whereas with proportional systems, you can build coalitions that are cross-racial, that include black interests. Um, and then black people in Republican districts would have some power in a proportional system as would white progressives. So, you know, that's an issue that she discussed. And it's just a shame that, you know, when the Wall Street Journal called her the quota queen, Clinton dropped her as like a hot potato. She had been appointed to head the Civil Rights Division of Department of Justice. So, you know, if you go back and read her essays in that book, The Tyranny of Majority, you'll see a very thoughtful discussion of this problem. So, but the, the point I'm flagging is that, yeah, it's coming from the right wing, but it's also coming from incumbent de Democrat black politicians that want their safe gerrymandered districts just left alone, which means somebody like Robin that wants to challenge a black politician in a single member district, she's gonna be accused of splitting the black vote when she's actually saying she's a better representation of the black community. Thank you. Great. Um, I do have a, a question um, <clears throat> that a lot of people have, have asked is, uh, you know, a lot of people write very rightly so. Um, in fact, sometimes I'd say more apolitical people sometimes even have a better analysis at times because they're not, you know, caught up in all of the like specifics. But uh, sometimes people will say, man, you know, well, we could try that, but they're just going to find another way to game it, right? You know, people with the money are going to find another way to game it. Um, and there's a lot of rightness to that, right? You know, so um, how, do we, how do we do that? Because the time to do that and to fix the, um, the messaging is now on ranked choice voting um, and then even on pro proportional representation, which I think is even more powerful. Um, but how do, we, how do we make sure that this is being done right now? Because we already see some, some things like top four, top five, RCV, and if anyone wants to address that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, also, uh, we're probably going to be in about five minutes at asking the last questions. We will take questions from anyone who, who questions were not answered on this panel. You can email us at BAC at GP.org. So BAC is in Ballot Access Committee at GP.org. And uh, we will definitely get these questions to our panelists and, and get the answers to you. Um, 
But uh, please answer that question and Rose will have a few more questions um, before we, we uh, end this presentation. Anyone want to bite on that? Anyone take I'll, care to I'll take, take a stab. Huh? Um, I I think the best that I that I can uh, say for you is that there's no voting method that's perfect. Um, it, if there were, we would already be using it. <laughs> um, and so each voting method that's out there has pros and cons. It has some weaknesses. Um, at FairVote, we've really looked at the, at the range of options that are out there, and we have landed on ranked choice voting because we believe that it is the best of all the options out there. Um, it has, it ha its benefits occur frequently, and its weaknesses occur infrequently. And so when you're talking about gaming the system or finding some way to, you know, to manipulate it or whatever, um, ranked choice voting is incredibly difficult um, to do that with. It's, I mean, you could, you could drive yourself nuts playing, you know, playing a lot of, of hypothetical scenarios and saying, if this, then the voters should do that. And if that, then the voters should do that. But the thing is that as a voter, you would need a crystal ball that is incredibly accurate in order to know how everybody else is going to vote in order to figure out how to best strategize and manipulate your own vote. And so that's why we feel so strongly that um, that ranked choice voting is, is very difficult to game. I mean, people could people could ar argue about ways to do it, but it would be hard to do in reality. Well, no, says there are hands raised. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Lynn, Lynn has her hand up. Yeah. Lynn has her hand up. Yep. Um, so I'm going to try to address also, none of us really answered the question about gerrymandering. Um, I realized that after we all spoke. So Diane said something I already said, no perfect system. I also talked about what sort of problems we're trying to solve. And I talked about voter education. So these are all opportunities when you're looking at what type of system you want to convince your city council, your state legislature, you know, Congress, whatever it is, you have to figure out, again, what's the problem we're trying to solve and how can you best explain how this system solves that problem. Now, implementation is incredibly important. Uh, in the Bay Area, when RCV got passed, it still took forever to get it implemented. And then for cycle after cycle after cycle, the entrenched sort of like campaign elite, especially from the Democratic Party, kept fighting against it. So implementation cannot be overstated as a massive factor. I don't want to sugarcoat this, right? I mean, I like ranked choice voting. I particularly like it in multi-member districts for STV. Um, but, you know, you are creating districts. And as we've seen in this country, gerrymandering is an issue. So... One answer is, of course, if you're doing something that's at large and you're not creating any districts. So that could be one solution is you don't have to say, take a nine member council and create three three member districts. You just have one at large district. And in that case, your threshold supports 10%. That's great. That's gonna really increase the diversity of your council um, if it's a council. So I do wanna just highlight and underscore implementation is incredibly important. And so those decisions you make to Tony's point of whether it's top four or top five, Typically, preferential voting or ranked choice voting, the idea was you can rank as few or as many candidates as you like. But then what happens is we go to the ballot and then a, a city or state gets involved and then voting equipment companies get involved and they start saying things like, oh, well, you actually really can only uh, rank the top three or you can rank the top four. And these end up being these practical considerations. And so you have to decide what you fight for. Do you fight for as few or as many as you'd like? Uh, do you agree that, okay, we're going to go with just top three or top four or top five because that's what this particular voting company is telling them that they can do an affordable dollar amount? Because, again, if you're trying to get voters to pass something and they're being told that there is this massive bill to pass uh, the system, that's going to be a problem for them. Fortunately, with ranked choice voting in places like Oakland, I ran that campaign in 2006, we were going from a two-round runoff system to a one-round runoff system. Them. So we were saving massive amount of money. Same thing in New York City is that the citywide primaries used to have a two-round runoff and they would cost, you know, 20 plus million dollars. So I'm just trying to mention all these like practical considerations because they are very important when you decide what type of system that you are going to push for. Thank you.
Thank you. So uh, we're getting to our final questions here. So here's one I want to direct uh, to the whole panel. I know this is something um, I know uh, Howie Hawkins has a pretty strong answer on, but I think it's something that concerns some Greens. If some people believe that with ranked choice voting, it further empowers the Democratic Party and that it, it gives the vote over should. Now, now, I would be honest that if I were given the choice to say in the 2020 election, vote for um, Howie Hawkins first and Joe Biden second, I'd have just put Howie Hawkins as my choice. I did, I did not want Joe Biden to be a choice for me. But um, anyways, but some people do you know, have a concern about that. So I was wondering uh, where the panelists were on that. Thank you. Howie. Well, it's true if we're talking about ranked choice voting in single member districts. Now that's inherent to executive offices, but not to legislatures. If we use RCV for multi-member districts, we're gonna get proportional representation and the Greens are gonna be included because we already got enough support. You just need to look at public opinion polls on our issues, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, cutting the military budget and putting that money into social and environmental protections. In fact, the majority of people are with us, not Biden and Trump and their people. Um, but the problem, and that's why I emphasize, Green should not accept when we're talking about RCV for legislative bodies, single member districts. It's not gonna change anything. It's about the same as plurality voting. If you do ranked choice voting, you know, like in Australia, they won one out of 150 districts. Um, you know, that's less than 1% when they had 10% of the vote countrywide for the house there. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it empowers the Democrats. It doesn't take power from them. Um, if we go with single member district ranked choice voting for legislative bodies. That's why, you know, I say hold out for multi-member, fight for that. Single member and legislative bodies doesn't change much. Thank you, Harry. Lynn and then Diane. Lynn? Let, go, let Diane go first and then... Oh, okay, I'll Diane and then... Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I would just uh, say uh, in response to Howie's comments that I think that in addition to being idealistic about the best system we could possibly have, we also have to be practical about getting it done. And the hard truth is that right now the people in power whose support we need to make these changes are people in the two major parties. And so the chances of getting multi-winner, um, multi-member districts through and, and, and adopted right now is, is a pretty heavy lift. Um, and, it, and it's strategic to try to do this incrementally and, um, and to, to kind of have milestone goals. And so, you know, we believe at Fair Vote that a big step toward getting this Shangri-La of multi-member districts that will create proportional representation, a big stepping stone toward that is normalizing the ranked ballot. We need to get voters used to seeing ranked ballots and using ranked ballots and getting experience under their belt and recognizing how easy it is. We really believe that once voters get a chance to use a ranked ballot for any election, um, they're gonna start saying, wait a minute, how come I get to rank my ballot for my city council election, but I, I have to pick just one for my congressional election. <laughs> I wanna rank my ballot you know, on all my elections. We really believe there will, there will be a snowball effect. So um, I would urge you not to naysay the single winner ranked choice voting just because it's not good, it's not good enough. Um, I would encourage you to view it as um, a stepping stone toward the full reforms that we are aiming for in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, we're getting a little feedback uh, here. Lynn. All right, so I almost feel like I want to change what this say. Um, I first heard about ranked choice voting 
And back in 1995, at a conference in Albuquerque that um, I helped organize for the Green Party, it was a national conference, and a representative from Center for Voting and Democracy, which is now called Fear, but was there. And at that time, exactly what I just said, the case was made that let's focus on um, single member ranked choice voting and then move to multi member ranked choice voting, also known as STV. That's been 27 years since I heard that strategy. And um, while I agree we should not naysay and that where we can implement RCV in single member districts, we should. But I also think unless we consistently um, make an effort to push toward proportional representation, it's not going to happen. So this idea was a good one, but in practice, it just hasn't been happening. The few places where we have STV, like Minneapolis, when they made a decision that when they put this issue on the ballot, there were single member seats for council, but their uh, Park and Recreation Board had multi-member districts. So they put on the ballot that this was going to be a ranked voting um, system for both council and the, the Park and Recreation. And so because of that, they were able to pass it for both single member and multi member seats. But in New York City, you know, activists spent a long time, including Green Party activists, debating whether or not we should move towards STV or just go for the win for RCV in a single member seat. And so, from a practical point of view, yes, this now means that millions of people are being introduced to the idea of ranking their candidates. It means that the voting equipment companies and the board of elections have had to go and, and invest in that voting equipment. But the question really becomes, you know, if not now, when? You know, I feel like we just heard this again and again and again. And again, I don't want to in any way negatively complain about ranked race voting for majority systems. But unless we prioritize professional representation, I just do not see how we're going to get there. I've been looking at the chat and people just keep talking about RCV and they mostly are talking about it in single member seats. And so I just, I'm sorry that I'm being so forceful on this issue, but I feel like we're missing an opportunity and I really appreciate how we take on it because I think we absolutely agree. We just come at it from like different angles, which is why it's so great that this panel is put together. Thank you. Thank you. Howie, you have your hand up. Um, Tony, please unmute Howie. How you I think the role okay. of the Green Party is to provide real solutions, not make compromises that other politicians are going to try to make. We had a uh, proportional ranked choice voting, single transferable vote in some like 30 cities from came out of the progressive movement. And it got smashed because black people started getting elected and lefties started getting elected. Uh, so we've had it. New York City, the the commit, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, Charter Commission that came up with this ranked choice voting for the primaries, but not the general, when the Greens might benefit, knew all about what they did between 37 and 47. They had proportional ranked choice voting in New York. That's when the first Black was elected. That was uh, Adam Clayton Powell, the third on the uh, American Labor Party. He had to be a third party candidate. The Democrats wouldn't run him. First woman elected to the city council in New York. Um, so we've done this, and I don't think it's our role as a Green Party uh, to take that position. And the other thing I want to point out is where we have got proportional ranked choice voting in the last few years, it's been uh, in the context of civil rights cases. Um, I think it's called East Point, Michigan. That's where Black people were excluded. Desert Palm, California, where Latinos were excluded. And Albany, California, where Asians were excluded. So. This is just to suggest in your own communities, you might have a situation where an ethnic minority is being excluded and you have a civil rights case. Now, they didn't have to take these all the way to court and win there because the, you know, the powers that be decided it'd be better to make the change than go through a court fight and lose. So, yeah, I say when we're talking about legislative body, our role as a Green Party is to demand proportional representation. Other people can ask for compromises, but Lynn is right. You know, you fight and you fight and you finally win single member district ranked choice voting. Then you're gonna turn around and say, well, what we really wanted was multi-member proportional representation. They're gonna tell you to get lost. Thank you, Harry. So our last question, I think this is a good one to leave us off on because um, what it's about is getting stuff done. And uh, this question is, 
any advice for community activists hoping to get proportional representation and municipal in municipal ele elections. Excuse me. Any takers? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, okay. Okay. So. I've been involved with a couple of different efforts. So as I mentioned earlier, I worked for the New Zealand Green Parliament and they passed MMP. And then we, one of the then co-leaders of the Green Party had passed private matters legislation so that we could use STV for local territorial authorities, what we would call like a local council. I was also involved in British Columbia. They had had a referendum um, on STV as a result of a citizens assembly, which was a process where similar to a jury, they randomly selected people from each district around um, the province and had them study different voting systems for a year and then place their recommendation on the ballot. We've heard a couple of times about charter revision commissions. There's opportunities to address these issues. And so I think the, the big piece about recommending how to do it already mentioned, figure out what problem you're trying to solve. How we mentioned that sometimes it's something that you might be able to actually solve legally. Sometimes it might be something you're able to get a council to pass on its own. Sometimes it needs to be a ballot referendum. There's all these different pathways. You have to figure out what is actually even allowed in your jurisdiction and then figure out again the problem you're trying to solve and how you're going to sell this to the voter. Because someone in the comment mentioned, you know, it's hard enough to convince them about um, RCV. Well, again, RCV in single member seats and multi member seats is exactly the same as the voter. Where it's different is that threshold or quota of support. So the results are, are drastically different. But, you know, if, if I go to the New Zealand example, just briefly, when they worked to change to MMP, they actually had a two part question on the ballot. The first question was Do you want to change the current voting system? And then if yes, you got to choose which voting system you wanted to change to. So that was highly effective because what you saw was the deep dissatisfaction that people had with the current voting system. And that really is, for all of us, the first step. Unless other people recognize there's a problem, you're never going to get them to change because there's the inertia of the status quo and there are these two-party establishments and the corporate elite and, and the moneyed interests who have so much invested in not making change. So. An option could be doing something like they did in New Zealand, which is asking that two-part question. It is an interesting approach. I just wanted to toss it out there because I haven't had that much of an opportunity to mention how different countries have tackled this. But there is a long history in this country and a long history around the world of doing this kind of work. So that really is something that we should be looking at because the fact that RCD and proportional representation have a proven track record is incredibly important. And I think that's something that at least when I run campaigns for this, the idea that it has a proven track record has really been proven um, a good selling point to, to voters. Thank you. Okay, next is Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey, Rose. Thanks. Uh, just real simple, what I've found worked for me, uh, and I, I mean worked for me in terms of helping me understand it, is just simple graphics. You know, when you're talking about ranked choice voting, having a sample sample ballot to show people. People might not have ever heard this before. So like just walk them through how they would actually do it when they do it. And then with proportional representation, the graphics that Diane had earlier today in her presentation, I mean, that really just helps explain to people what we're talking about here and why this is uh, not just a fairer system, but a better system. Thank you. And uh, Diane? Diane, you're muted. Sorry about that. No I can't problem. do, uh, you know, a whole uh, strategy and organizer seminar in a one minute answer. But what I what I will say is that there are ranked choice voting organizations across the country at the state level, not every single state, but many, many, many states now have state level ranked choice voting organizations. Um, and what I would encourage activists um, and interested voters to do is to find the state organization in your state and join them and get involved. You can um, go to our website, fairvote.org and um, look under uh, 
advocacy or get involved. Uh, um, and there's a there's a page that lists. It's got a nice map, and I'll put the link in the chat um, in just a minute. That uh, where you can find the state organization and the leadership of those organizations have been spending many 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 <laughs> hours and days working on strategy. And the strategy is different in different political environments. It's not a one size fits all. Um, sometimes it's about educating voters. If you're doing a ballot initiative and it's going to be up to voters, you know, voting to adopt ranked choice voting or proportional representation. But in states that don't have ballot initiative, it's going to be a legislative effort and it's going to be a matter of educating legislators. And those are the current legislators who are currently in office. And so it's got to be strategic about illustrating to them how this can potentially benefit them. I think the major parties, you know, a good talking point is with ranked is voting, you don't have to worry about a third party spoiler anymore. It's okay if there's a green candidate and a libertarian candidate and a social uh, a democratic socialist candidate and whatever, because that's not going to split the progressive vote um, any, you know, in the way that it does with plurality voting. So um, I encourage folks to, to, um, to be passionate and also to be strategic um, and to, um, band together and not uh, not reinvent the wheel. And the best way to do that is to join the existing organizations and lend your energy and support. So thanks for letting me make that pitch. Thank you so much, Diane. Hallie. Yeah, this is uh, just a tactic you can use with regard to the media and your campaigns. We don't only have to educate the voters, we gotta educate reporters and editorial boards. So you should meet with them and educate them about, you know, ranked choice voting and proportional ranked choice voting, whatever the campaign is for. And then when you get into the campaign, demand that your opponents take a position. So that's one news release. Then if they say no, you denounce them as any democratic exclusive, you know, the exclusion, excluding people. And if they say yes, you declare victory and say that demonstrates why you need Greens in the, can in the campaigns to bring issues to the fore and advance them. So I think, uh, you know, that's just re with regard to the media. And that helps educate the voters as well. Thank you so much, Howie. Uh, panelists, thank you so much. Uh, thank everyone for I, the wonderful questions. I, uh, it's been a really lively and educational. I do want to. And I'm going to bring it over to Tony to close us out. Tony. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, this conversation has highlighted why it is absolutely so necessary for us to support independent, uh, well, we're one of the few progressive uh, parties because, uh, and left parties, because we open up the political space for these kinds of discussions. We've been, uh, Greens have been championing, um, championing, um, debt forgiveness and student debt forgiveness for years and years. And, you know, naysayers were actually, you know, it, even some progressive naysayers were saying, oh, blah, blah, blah. you know, now we found in the past elect electoral cycle, that was a big issue. This, these are, these are, these are issues that are being brought into, um, you know, uh, main street, the American mainstream. And it's because of parties like ours that create that political space. So please do take the opportunity to not only contact your representatives, but contact your Greens, help to build this party, help to, if you don't have time to, to make a lot of meetings, please donate, Do donate to the ballot access committee, donate to our party. We really appreciate, um, you know, all of our panelists for being here, Lynn Serpy, Howie Hawkins, Matthew Ho, Robin, uh, Robin Harris, uh, and Diane Sofer. Thank you so much for all being here today. This has been a Fantastic presentation, and I hope that we can use this for further uh, political education. Also want to thank uh, Rose and Tommy and Lizzie and all of our co-mods for uh, helping us on our live streams as well. Have a great night and uh, happy RCV day. And tomorrow the work begins. Again, let's fight for this. Thanks so much for inviting us. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.